Uh, good afternoon, uh, evening or night, ladies and gentlemen, depending on where you are. This is Yaroslav Mar, the president of the Federal Republic of Lost Island. And uh, today our guest is a Lost Islandic citizen, Norbu Dorj uh, Genin Lama, who will give a lecture talk about Buddhism, a right-wing approach. It is no secret that Buddhism often attracts followers of left-wing ideologies, but our today's guest is a right-winger and uh, considers right-wing views not only uh, possible to have as a Buddhist, but also that these views are nature for the Buddhist philosophy. Today we will find out what is the actual ideology of Buddhism, if any, and why are so many Buddhists left-wing? You may ask your questions in the chat room, and we will answer them all. We would also appreciate your donations, which will be spent on further development of Lost Island and on arranging more lectures. Uh, Norbo, I know that you were not born to a Buddhist family and uh, obviously Buddhism is one of Russia's traditional religions but still it is a bit exotic for a Russian to not only convert to Buddhism but also to become a Buddhist cleric as in your case. So could you elaborate on, on your spiritual journey? What led you to Buddhism? Okay, in fact, I was born in the far east of Russia, and my my uncle, that uh, is middle brother of my dad, used to be very interested in occultism and esoteric because it was very popular in Russia in the 90s. He had a lot of books on the themes. For example, he had 12 tomes of books about black magic that he had locked in his bookshelf. So I had never knew what was written there. And occasionally I found in our bookshelf a t Tibetan book of that. In Tibetan it's called Bard Hurdle. As a child, I was a great fan of uh, computer games about zombies, necromancy, etc. So when I saw that book, I was uh, very glad to find it. I said, wow, it must be about zombies or something like that. But in fact, it turned out not to be so. But in spite of it, I was greatly amazed by this book, and that was a start for my learning of Buddhism. I was 11 years old when it happened. Before that, I was quite a re religious Orthodox Christian child, but finally I became dis disappointed in Russian Orthodox Church because you know that Christian religion spe speaks about modesty, about having a moderate lifestyle, but when you look to our Russian Orthodox High Priest, to our Patriarch, you can see that they don't lead such a way of life. So I decided to convert to Buddhism. And that book greatly influenced me. Finally, I began to study some Buddhist books. Firstly, I learned how to meditate. Then I started to learn some Buddhist practices, getting 
teaching and instructions from some Russian lamas or some foreign lamas from Tibet or USA or something like that. And fi finally, for about uh, two years ago, I went to one Tibetan Lama in Moscow because I wanted to discuss with him all my spiritual experience that I had for several years. And he told to me that the things I do, the things I believe in, are somehow wrong if we will consider them from a prospect of Buddhism, but if we speak about traditional Tibetan religion of Bon that appeared before Buddhism, then for that prospect, all the things I do are completely right. So I became to practice Bon. You know, there are uh, two main branches of Bon religion. One is called Yundrun Bon or Eternal Bon. It's the old one. And also there is a called Reformed Bon that appeared in the 18th century. And in Tibetan it's called Bon Sarma. This uh, branch of Bon has been recently recognized by Dalai Lama as the fifth school of Tibetan Buddhism. Also, for, for about two years ago, I became Jenin. I got the lowest range as, as a Lama and for about a year ago I had my first service on Tibetan New Year. So uh, moving to the main subject of uh, the lecture, I'm not an expert of Buddhism and obviously not a Buddhist but uh, my impression was always that uh, Buddhism is Mm, indeed, a, a kind of left-wing religion because of uh, all the socialist Buddhists, of the apparent similarity between Buddhism and uh, Western socialism. But uh, your approach is uh, completely opposite to what I always heard and knew about Buddhism. So could you mm, elaborate on your beliefs and about the stance of Buddhism on the social and economic issues. Okay. You know that uh, the nuclear part of all left ideologies is uh, an idea of egalitarianism. They say that all the people, despite of anything, are equal. And when leftists started to learn Buddhism, they can see that in a lot of Buddhist books th there is reason that people are equal, that uh, all of Buddhist teachers also say the same things. Then, for example, when uh, you have so-called five poisons of your mind, two of them are envy and pride, you have to meditate ab about equity of yourself and other people. But now we have to consider what is the real equity in Buddhist religion. So let us see. First, we all are biologically equal. In fact, if uh, because of our karma or because of our own fault or because of other people's fault, we hadn't become disabled people, or if we were not born disabled because of our 
parents' fault or because of some uh, genetic disease or like that. We are healthy people. We have two arms, two legs. We have our internal parts that can function in a appropriate way. That's why, as biological organism, we are all equal. Also, if we speak about the main idea of Buddhism, about the origin of all the things and all the living creatures, we can say that they all have originated from a, an eternal emptiness. And all the things are just some ways it represents itself. So in a prospect of uh, origin of all the people and all the living creations, we also are all equal. And the third thing here is uh, about the way our mind works. Because all the living creatures tend to avoid unpleasant things and everybody wants to be happy. Not only people, but also animals, also some other creatures, also a lot of spirits we can have a deal with. So, in our basic needs, all people are also equal. That is what uh, Buddhism religion tells us about people's equity. But we here have to ask ourselves a question. What is the prior thing of practicing Buddhism? We all know that the priority here is uh, in uh, getting enlightened and in uh, getting final realization, as we call it. All the Buddhist books, all the Buddhist teachers, no matter what branch of Buddhism is it, they consider all the things that can help you to become enlightened as useful as the things that you have to do. And other things that can cause you any obstacle to this main aim are useless or even harmful. So we have to see whether are all the people equal in their ability to get enlightened. And here, if we will look to, for example, Orthodox Buddhism books, you know this is tradition called Theravada. It uh, is mostly represented in such a countries like Ceylon or like Myanmar, or if we look at uh, Mahayanic books of uh, Chinese or Tibetan Buddhist teachers, we can see that in that aspect people are not equal. They are subdivided in three categories of people with lower abilities, people of medium abilities, and people with higher abilities. And according to uh, what level of abilities you have, you should learn some specific Buddhist practices if you want to get enlightened. Of course, uh, most of people are not able to get enlightened during their life or even during their whole life. Most of us uh, have to spend several lives to achieve this target. 
Because if uh, all the people were indeed equal, then we all would be Buddhists or the opposite things could also be and there would not be any Buddhists at all. That's uh, we can came to a conclusion that in the prior prospect of Buddhist religion people are not equal and their intellectual and their spiritual abilities are not equal. I see we have a question in the chat room. What do you think is the main value of Buddhism? Is Buddhism necessary for the whole world? If so, why? You, you know that we have to consider that in, in a way the two main branches of Buddhism religion tell us about that. If we will speak about Theravadan Buddhism, it uh, tells us that the main thing in your life is to get enlightened that you can do it yourself only you sh should better become a monk because ordinary people could not get enlightened yeah or other people cannot get enlightened also and you should care about yourself about your own enlightenment and not to carry about other people in spite of you should be good and kind to them. Uh, but uh, most of uh, Buddhists in the world are of uh, Mahayana tradition and the main value here is uh, so-called uh, Bodhicitta. Here is a great controversy between Mahayanic and Theravadan Buddhism because uh, Mahayana tradition says that you have to care about other people and even if you get enlightened you should stay here and you should help other people to get enlightened too. So there is an idea of Bodhisattva and Bodhisattva is a person who is already enlightened but who doesn't want to go to Nirvana because he or she have decided to stay here and to help other people. But in the prospect of Theravadan tradition such an idea is a great nonsense because uh, they say that you can go to nirvana or you can not to go to nirvana and if you are you are already enlightened you will go to nirvana immediately and you cannot stay here anymore the thing that uh, all the buddhist teachers always talk about Dalai Lama also talks about this a lot is uh, that uh, now when people especially in Western countries are mostly obsessed with materialistic values they are greatly obsessed with idea of success getting a lot of money being respected in society, getting some high position of power and so on and so on. 
but finally all the things only lead them to suffer. And we do not need such a materialistic people, but we need people that uh, have uh, sympathy to each other, that help each other, and that are kind of each other. And that is also something that uh, attracts people of left ideologies because uh, their ideas of uh, tolerance that is very popular among them they connect with that uh, Buddhist idea of Bodhicitta but in fact it uh, doesn't work in such a way and uh, in our further discussion I will explain why is it so. So now uh, that we talk about uh, the relationship between uh, Buddhism and uh, Western socialism and progressivism, uh, I know that you consider feminism incompatible with Buddhism. Could you elaborate why? Well, it's in fact if you want to turn light on this question everybody is able to make it himself or herself. For example, if we will look at the earliest Buddhist books that uh, are pres preserved by Theravadan Buddhists in their famous so-called Pe Pali Canon, yeah, here we can see a lot of uh, things co called about women and all that things that are told about women are quite unpleasant. When you will look at Jatakas that describes the life of Buddha or if you look at such an old ancient Buddhist book like Anuttara Nikaya, you can see here such words like women are full of negative emotions, women are harmful, a woman should never rule a country, and if you learn about such a country, you should despise it and despise people who serve that women. Also, according to Theravadan tradition, uh, women can not get enlightened at all. In Mahanic tradition, the things are not so sad because uh, there are quite a lot of enlightened women, but it also told us that it's uh, much harder for women to get enlightened than for men because uh, they are tend to follow their negative emotions and they can't control themselves. In fact, women also have one big advantage. If we will compare them to men. As I told you before, the main idea of Mahayanic tradition is the idea of Bodhicitta. And here you have to be compassionate to other people. And this uh, feature of mind, this feature of character, is uh, much more a female one. Because uh, historically, 
men are not so compassionate and they also had to lead wars to compete with each other so they are not tend to be compassionate and all the women have such an advantage so you if we imagine our main target of getting enlightened like reaching the top of a high mountain we can say that an ordinary man has to go here by foot because uh, he has no any advantages but also he has not any unnecessary cargo like negative emotions but if we talk about an ordinary woman it looks like if she travels here sitting on a very fast horse that is her ability to be compassionate to other people but also this horse have to carry really a lot of unnecessary cargo that is a lot of negative emotions that, that women are tend to follow so we can say that f feminism is also about equity between a man and a woman but if we consider this question in the prospect of uh, Buddhist tradition was Theravadin or Mahayanic prior target to get enlightened a man But uh, I that if a woman can get rid of her negative emotions, she can get enlightened in a very fast way and she can do it much more faster than an ordinary man. Unfortunately, there are quite a few of sort of women in our modern world. That's why we don't have a lot of enlightened and usually Mahayanic teachers say that there is about one enlightened woman for 90 men. Uh, what about uh, same-sex marriage, for example, which is obviously uh, an important issue for the Western society and one that has crucial importance for left-wingers. So th there are many left-wingers who support uh, same-sex marriage and who also support Buddhist values. So do these two go together? In fact, that two things are completely incompatible. When uh, members of uh, LGBT society told about same-sex marriages with Dalai Lama, he told them that we have our religious books and homosexual relations uh, are inappropriate thing and I am not going 
here anything according the way you want me to do. Also, in uh, all the religious books, if we want to learn about some things that are considered as sins in Buddhist religion, we can hear here a thing called inappropriate sexual behavior. It like uh, having sexual relations with uh, inappropriate people in inappropriate place and inappropriate way. And if we look at who are that inappropriate people, from there we can see first that would be a monk, that would be another person who is married, or that would be a person of the same sex as we are. And that means that homosexual relations are completely inappropriate because they are considered as a sort of inappropriate sexual behavior, and inappropriate sexual behavior is considered as a sin. And does uh, Buddhism have a particular stance on abortion? In, in fact, uh, I haven't met an, any particular states about uh, this problem. We can consider this also in two ways. Because first, we all know that uh, the first thing you should not do as a Buddhist, you should not kill any living creatures. But here we have to learn from what period of time a child that isn't born yet can be considered as a living creature. Of course, if uh, a child already has a brain, if a child has a heart, has a nervous system, then uh, the child can be considered as a living creature. And in such a case, an abortion would be a murder of the child. But if it's not so in some early months of natal period, abortion is possible because a child cannot be considered as a living creature. Of course, uh, other main, main thing is Buddhist religion is that we have to decrease a level of suffering in all the world. But if you are going to born a child, and if uh, you are not able to provide the child a decent life, appropriate condition, you can not provide a well-being of your future child, then you have to admit that if you give born to the child, your child will face a lot of suffering. And in such a prospect, it would be better not to give birth of such a child for no, not leaving he or she to lead a further life that would be full of sufferings.
So, if I am correct, uh, Buddhism is not uh, as categorically pro-life as, for example, Christianity. Yeah, it, it is really so. Mm -hmm. The main thing that makes difference here is uh, that in Christianity we consider a child as a living creature from the very beginning. And in uh, Buddhism, there is not uh, such a way of uh, considering that question. Because, uh, for example, Dalai Lama said that uh, Buddhism have to be quite a modern religion that Buddhism has to follow modern science and if uh, there are some states in Buddhism that are not compatible with uh, modern scientific views then they should be thrown away and if uh, of course we will uh, look at this question from a prospect of science then we can say that uh, a child cannot be considered as a living creatures from the very beginning because uh, he or she has no some uh, parts of uh, organism that uh, help the child to function as a living creature. There is a common perception that Buddhism is a peaceful religion more so than the Abrahamic religions. Do you agree this is the case? In, in, in fact, uh, it also depends of a branch of Buddhism. Of course, uh, Buddhism do doesn't support violence in any way. Uh, if you have to defend your relatives or defend your religion or defend yourself, then you shouldn't allow to beat your other cheek like it is told in Christian religion, but you have to struggle. Of course, uh, some, some uh, Buddhists, for example, Theravadan Buddhists in Myanmar, have nothing uh, common with tolerance. Maybe you know the things that now are happening there when uh, local Buddhists headed by uh, lo local very radical a priest struggle with local ethnic Muslim minorities. They have fights with them, they have some uh, conflicts with them, and, uh, and uh, f finally they would like to banish them at all from their country. So, uh, not, not peaceful at all. To be honest, that was some reason why all that thing started. 
because some of that ethnic minority Muslims raped one girl who was a Buddhist. And th that was a reason of uh, great anger from all the Buddhist society. Because of that, all that stuff started. I would like to ask you about the economic doctrine of Buddhism, if there is any. Uh, because uh, we often see socialists turning to Buddhism. Uh, is there actually any connection between Buddhism and socialism, or what is that attracts socialists in Buddhism so much? Yeah, it's really so, because uh, in Buddhism a private property is not considered as a priority. And you should uh, have only that property that you really need. There is a common state that if you have something that you don't need, then you tend to buy unnecessary things, then you tend to luxury, and then you tend to having nothing more that you would like to buy or you would like to have and because of that you face with a great suffering. So that's why you should better not to start that chain at all and to have only necessary property. Also in uh, all the Buddhist temples, no matter what branch of Buddhism is it, all the property between monks is common. They have uh, very few things that they can call their personal things. And uh, a lot of monks that are high ranged are not allowed to touch money. So there is a special person who leads all the financial operations in that temple. So we can say that uh, Buddhist temples are organized even in some how communistic way. That's why socialists are greatly attracted by Buddhism religion. But in fact, uh, we cannot say that this uh, way of organizing the monastery economy is unique only for Buddhism because for example Christian monasteries usually have the same system. So uh, would it be correct to say that uh, Buddhism is socially conservative but also supports left-wing economic policies. I, I think uh, that would be completely right. But if Buddhism is uh, socially conservative, uh, do you have any idea why the Dalai Lama is uh, so friendly towards Joe Biden, who is more to the left of center as compared to Donald Trump? 
In fact, it is a thing that a lot of us would like to know differently. A lot of right-wing people in Buratia in Russia or in Mongolia have become very disappointed with Dalai Lama because of his supporting of Biden's policy. But we can only guess why is it so. There could be different variants, in fact. The most sad is that because of uh, being a very elderly person, the Dalai Lama tends to have some uh, mental problems connected with his age. But if it is really so, it would be very sad for all of us. Other variant also possible is that is uh, some sort of uh, diplomatic step because in a position that Dalai Lama is nowadays as a leader of uh, Tibetan people who is in exile from his own native country. So he has to t take any support that he can. Also, we have to remember that the law of supporting Tibet was uh, made not by Joe Biden. That law was offered by Donald Trump and Biden here only has decided not to reject this law, but to prolong its action. Also, we can think that maybe Dalai Lama doesn't support Biden's policy, but uh, according to the concept of Bodhicitta, he has some sort of compassion to Biden. He thinks uh, that Biden is wrong in his beliefs and uh, he hopes that maybe in some time Biden would change his policy. For my own opinion, that uh, is quite a naive point of view, because usually leftists don't change their beliefs, especially such uh, old people like Biden. But uh, in the prospect of a concept of Bodhicitta, such a hope has its right to take place. Just find it a bit weird because uh, one of the biggest criticisms of Biden is that he will be not harsh enough towards China. And uh, Tibet has no worse enemy than China. But still the Dalai Lama apparently favors uh, Biden over Trump, who was solidly anti-China and supported Tibet. The only thing I can say about it is that the Dalai Lama really has to take any support that he can get in such a situation. And uh, if we 
speak about politics. Now you know that there are some conflicts between China and India, and a lot of people in India support Tibet and support Dalai Lama very much. But I, I'm not sure whether in India alone would be able to stop Chinese ambitions. Because I think that uh, USA or Russia would not help India in such a case. Mostly because they are afraid of Chinese power. And uh, if we speak about the USA, that, el that is also a pr problem of economics, because uh, we all know that a lot of uh, American firms have their fabrics placed in China, so China has uh, an ability to press uh, on uh, M M American capitalists and uh, Chinese pressure here could be quite painful for them. But uh, in principle, is it uh, considered acceptable for a Buddhist to support a person like Biden, who, as I understood it from your lecture, holds views that are incompatible with Buddhist values? In, in fact, we shouldn't support him, of course. We can only think of, of him like of a man who <coughs> has uh, a lot of sins or a lot of mental troubles. And uh, the way we can look at him, we can look at him only with a pity. So, if I understood it correctly, as far as uh, right-wing or left-wing policies are concerned, uh, Buddhism indeed is lining more to the right in terms of social issues. So, left-wingers who support Buddhism because of its apparent uh, tolerance do not fully understand its doctrine because Buddhist values are not the same as Western values of tolerance. But at the same time, it is not incorrect to say that there is indeed a similarity between Buddhism and socialism, because Buddhism does not give any special role to private property and does not consider it something very important. Is that correct? Yes, it's, that's correct. Well, if we don't have any new questions in the chat, I guess we will adjourn the lecture now. Uh, would you like to say something to the viewers to, to end it? Yes, I... I I send call of you for your presence, for your time you spent to learn such uh, an important things about Buddhism religion. I hope you ap appreciate that little efforts we made to make things clear for you.
and also all that efforts I can send to a well-being of all living creatures. Thank you for viewing us. This lecture was brought to you by the Philosophy Club of the Federal Republic of Lost Island. We have more lectures and plans and if you have any ideas, if you would like to participate or maybe to challenge someone to a debate, please contact us and we will arrange a streaming. See you on our next lectures.